click. There's probably no more ubiquitous sound of the 21st century than the, the sound of a mouse clicking or of someone tapping on their tablet. I tried to record a, a, a sound of a mouse clicking, but I couldn't get the kind of quality that I was wanting. But we've all probably heard that sort of click, 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 click. Debbie says when you hear click, 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 you're clicking too much because it's not working right. And it's not going to work right unless you stop clicking. Oh, there's Debbie. How are you? She's sitting in a different place and threw me off this morning. <laughs> you know, we click. We try to click our way through those kinds of things. But uh, while the web has sort of brought us ease of communication in many ways, it's also shouldered us with a burden of distraction. You see, you can't read an online article, for example, without being bombarded by ads or perhaps even worse, temptations to click on another article that then takes you down a rabbit trail that maybe leads you to another article and so on, and pretty soon you're four or five articles away from the one you started out on to begin with. You know what I mean. There's some headline there that catches your attention, and off we go, ignoring why we got on the computer to begin with and we're off into the world of who knows where. Well, savvy internet users call these headlines, these other articles, clickbait. And that's for the purposes of my sermon this morning. I'm also going to call them devil's snares. Because technically speaking, clickbait refers to any kind of an ad or a link with a, with a shocking or a salacious headline or a teasing headline or a photograph that's designed to just get us a little bit curious, and then it sucks us in. Well, here's the reality. Does the headline deliver? No, it doesn't. Typically, it doesn't deliver what it offers, and your click usually results in a bevy of even more ads and even more useless information. At, for example, at the bottom of a recent Wired magazine article, and Wired is a very... Uh, popular and, uh, and legitimate kind of magazine to be reading online, it's respected. It's about the Internet. But at the bottom of the Wired article were these headlines, Brady Bunch Secrets That Will Leave You Speechless. Well, you can put Brady Bunch and fill it in with Gilligan's Island or Dragnet or Adam-12 or any other TV show from the 60s, and you'll still get the same article. Or how about this? Have you seen this one? American residents born between 1936 and 1966 are in for a, and you can fill in the blank, a shock, a tax refund, a missing inheritance. You know where it goes. Or what about this one? What the Star Trek cast looks like now is jaw-dropping. Fill that one in with any other show of the 70s or 80s, and you get to the same kind of articles. Here's the kind that pull me in. 21 facts about the Amish that most people don't know. There's just enough of, maybe there might be something about the Amish that I don't know, and I'm, I'm a curious kind of guy, so I'm going to click that one. See, I'm clicking right now. No, didn't get me anywhere either, but a waste of time. That's the problem. When you click on any of those, you've burned an hour without even realizing it sometimes. Is it any wonder that I refer to them as the devil's snares? It's no wonder then that the devil himself is a master of the clickbait. He's always trying to get people distracted from what really matters. And I'll tell you right now, the distraction for me this morning is this loaf of bread right here because it is just coming up. <laughs> the clickbait is, let me get to that bread. It distracts you from what really matters. He doesn't deliver on what he promises, and he plays havoc with people that are driven by emotion rather than faith. You see, biblically speaking, there's no greater example of how this clickbait slash snare strategy works than in the passage we read this morning from Matthew, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. When you look at the way Matthew tells the story of Jesus, it's a very Jewish telling of it. In other words, Matthew presents 
clues that the Jewish reader is going to pick up on and fill in the blanks, so to speak, in their own minds because it's familiar to them. A lot of them are Old Testament clues as he works his way through the gospel. And here in chapter 4, it's real clear. Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days. Now, when you hear the number 40, what else comes to mind? It's louder because I can't. The ark, 40 days of rain. What else? 40 Lent, 40 days in the wilderness. How about 40 days that Moses spent on Mount Sinai? How about the 40 years wandering in the desert as they're looking for the promised land? So when they hear the word 40, the Jewish mind is going to jump to these kind of things and begin to, to fill in the blanks, so to speak. Well, in spite of the fact that God was present with them in the cloud and the fire and the tabernacle, the Israelites in those Old Testament stories still wrestled with what it meant to be God's people. And oftentimes... We see the stories in which they're giving in to temptation. If you literally take the word Israel, what does the Old Testament say Israel means? It means one who wrestles with God. Matthew, he sets the scene of Jesus' own temptation in the wilderness using that kind of imagery. And the temptations of Jesus reflect the temptations that Israel faced when they were in their desert sojourn. And so the devil shows up to offer Jesus some salacious shortcuts for ministry, which we're going to reflect upon the mission of Israel, and he begins each one of them with these words. If you are the Son of God, here's what's happening. Jesus is just one click away from the devil's bait. Will he fall for his snares or will he not? And what follows then are the three temptations of Jesus. And I'm going to share them with you in clickbait form. Let me read them to you like a headline that you might find on the bottom of your Facebook page. Clickbait headline number one. Making bread out of stones? The shocking dietary revolution that will change your life. You see, the devil's first piece of clickbait is to get Jesus to use his power transform stones into bread. And that was probably a, a real temptation for one, as the scripture says, who was famished after 40 days without food. He was hungry. But it's an even bigger con temptation when we put it into the context of the, the wider thing going on here. You see, many people in Jesus' day were hoping for a new exodus out of the practical slavery that they were facing under the Roman occupation. For many in Jesus' day, the Romans were just the Egyptians in a new form. They were looking for a Messiah that would look a lot like a new version of Moses, complete with God's provision of manna from heaven. And so turning stones into bread, that would be a sure sign for the people that the Messiah that they were looking for had finally come. Satan is wanting Jesus to conform to the people's expectations rather than God's. There's never any problem, is there, when we conform to somebody else's expectations? Is there? Of course, we know what Jesus was quite capable of doing. He could have pulled off that miraculous event right there in the desert. He, he's turned water into wine, so sure, why not turn some stones into bread? The Gospels report that he fed 5,000 people plus and had loaves and baskets of bread and fish left over. That was a sign of God's provision. In John's version of that story, the people wanted to take him by force and make him king because of his ability to multiply bread. That indicated that their vision of the Messiah was one that was going to give them the manna that they wanted. But John also tells us that in response to their demands that he become king, that what did Jesus do? It says he withdrew to the mountain by himself rather than take that bait. But Jesus understood the temptation that was before him in this sort of clickbait kind of thing, focusing on the product rather than the source. You see, the Israelites, if you look back to that 40-year wandering in the desert, what eventually happened, they got manna every day. They got quail at night. 
they had to use that man every day. They had to go out and pick it up because if they didn't, it would rot. And what, by the end of 40 years, they enjoyed it? No. They griped and complained because they got what they wanted rather than what God had wanted them to have. Jesus responded to the devil by quoting Moses' own warning to the people of Israel found in Deuteronomy. God humbled you by letting you hunger and then by feeding you with manna with which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus, he wasn't dependent on his own ability to provide for himself and for his people, but instead he understood that it started with God's provision and was based on God's promises, not what the people wanted him to do. He knew that the devil's temptation was to produce a product rather than to rely on the ultimate source from whom every good thing eventually comes. And both he and the people needed more than just a steady diet of bread. They needed to satisfy a diet for the word of God that would sustain them for the long haul. Now here's how it ties in with our lives. You know, we're too often tempted to seek the quick and the easy route to fill our empty bellies and our empty souls. We fill up on products, both spiritual and material, that, that satisfy our needs, but just for a little while. Well, Jesus is inviting us to consider that the only thing that is going to truly satisfy us is the presence of God in our lives, and that God will supply all of our needs. That's the reason Jesus will later tell his disciples to pray for their daily bread, not bread for a lifetime. You see, when we feed on the word of God and the bread of life, we are on a diet that will bring us health, not just for the day, but for eternity itself. Okay, clickbait headline number two. Man jumps from incredible height with no parachute. You won't believe what happens next. Well, the devil's second clickbait snare was to get a kind of YouTube video of Jesus jumping off the pinnacle of the temple down into the Kidron Valley. No net, no shoot. The fall would have meant certain death for anyone, but the devil was certain that Jesus could do it and land unscathed. That kind of video would have gone viral in our day instantly, and it would have ensured Jesus' celebrity status among the people of the world, not just a scraggly band of those 12 that decided to follow him and those hangers-on that went around as well. You know, the devil even tries to bait Jesus by using Scripture. He quotes from Psalm 91, 11 to 12, to, to pump up the fact that God would provide an angelic safety net if all you do is jump, he said, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Hmm. But a lot of clickbait, especially that of the semi-religious variety that the devil liked to use, well, it was a little bit out of context. Psalm 91, 9 through 10 says that God's protection is for circumstances that befall his people and not for those who stupidly test God by taking foolish risk. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, the scriptures say. So in response to the devil's clickbait, Jesus goes to scripture himself, Deuteronomy 6:16. And that passage is referring to, to Israel's testing of God in the wilderness by complaining about their lack of water. They say, do not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah. Jesus says that right to the devil's face. He says, basically, you want me to jump off the pinnacle? It's not going to happen. The scripture makes it clear. I'm not here to test God. In what way? What was, was going on here? What had the Israelites tested God for at Messiah? Well, Exodus 17, 7 sort of lays that out. It says, He called the place Massah and Meribah 
because the Israelites quarreled and they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Think about that. God had already brought them out of Egypt through the sea. He's led them in person. He's provided for them. He's protected them every day. And yet they're still wondering, is God really with us? Is God really here? Jesus didn't have any doubts about the presence of God. He had nothing that he needed to prove. At the very beginning of his ministry, he was convinced that he was following the will of his heavenly Father. Only hours, only days before, Jesus had been baptized in the River Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, the heavens opened, and we hear these words, that the Spirit of God descended like a dove on him, and a voice from heaven said, what did it say? This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Those words are the last words in chapter 3 of Matthew, immediately after those words are spoken. According to verse 1 of Matthew 4, Jesus is then led by the same Spirit out into the wilderness. Does the devil really think that Jesus might not believe that the God who was with him in the waters of baptism just hours or days ago was no longer with him now? Does the devil really think that Jesus might actually test God's faithfulness and his presence by flinging himself off the temple without a, a bird man suit or looking like some crazy flying squirrel? We know what the devil thought. But, or we can't know what the devil thought, but we do know what Jesus thought. For Jesus, it was a stupid idea to think that God wasn't with him. We don't test God that way. The lesson here for us is that we don't tempt God. We don't test God. We don't make our plans and expect God to conform to them or to bless them. We don't engage in risky behavior and expect God to protect us. We don't bend the scripture to suit our purposes, which is a huge temptation for a lot of people. We don't suggest that God is not with us because the scriptures make it clear that God is with us. And suggestions to the contrary, I think, probably are really irritate God, especially if God has blessed us in our past dealings with him. Clickbait headline number three, the secret to world dominion. It's easier than you think. All the kingdoms of the world, hmm. they've never really belonged to the devil, have they? But his final office is to make Jesus the kind of ruler that the devil could live with, one that would worship him. The kind of, that kind of ruler is the, the kind of political and military leader that the world normally sort of expects, one that can exercise power to keep everything in line without needing God's help to do it. You see, the devil offered Jesus the world as it is and as everyone expects it to be, and all that you need to do, Jesus, is just fall down and worship me. The devil, his way of owning, his way of manipulating our human hearts, but Jesus isn't interested in the world as it is and everyone expects it to be. He's going to come out of the wilderness preaching something different. He's going to come out preaching the rule and reign of God on earth. And that's a quite different governing system than what the devil is offering. You see, the devil's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. But God's kingdom is one of light. Colossians says, giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son that he loves. You see, the devil's kingdom, it's all about domineering authority. But God's kingdom is about servanthood. The devil's kingdom is about coercion, violence, and bondage. But God's kingdom is one of peace. The devil's kingdom, it's about the pleasure principle but God's kingdom is about holiness and right living. The devil's kingdom 
It's based on lies and deception, but God's kingdom is about truth, the kind of truth that will set us free. John says it this way in chapter 8, verse 44. You are from the father, your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. The devil's kingdom, a culture of death, but God's kingdom is a culture of life, both in this world and life eternal. Jesus said, it's the poor in spirit, it's the mourners, it's the meek, it's the merciful, it's the peacemakers, it's the persecuted that are going to one day inherit this kingdom of God. Those who worship the Lord their God and serve only him. You see, when we're tempted to click on those things that promote the world as the devil wants it, Jesus is here to remind us to turn our attention to the reality of God's kingdom, not the devil's fantasy world. Jesus, he already rules God's kingdom. He calls us to join him in making it a reality on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus refused to be drawn in by the devil's clickbait. Interestingly, the devil... Rebuffed three times, finally leaves Jesus alone, perhaps returning to Dante's ninth circle of hell where he might feel more at home because he didn't get a very welcoming response from this man, Jesus. You see, in any event, as we go about our daily lives, we are going to face plenty of pop-up temptations that are going to cross our paths. And our response is either going to be yeah, that sounds good, let me try it. Or maybe that's not so good. Maybe I should avoid it. And so I challenge you this season of Lent and all the days that follow this season to be aware of the devil's snares, of the clickbait that tends to pull you off course and into a worldly way of trying to live and away from the ways of God's kingdom. May we pray. Most gracious, most holy God, thank you so much for your son Jesus and the things that he taught us. Help us to resist temptation in the same way that he did. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.